Hey guys welcome to my channel today we are going to be doing what if Deku was a vigilante, make sure to like and subscribe disclaimer. There may be mature content and maybe 18 plus with that stuff out of the way let's begin to Zuku's credit. He managed to keep himself together and seemed fine until they got home. They heard a purring as soon as they entered the apartment. When they looked, they saw Pablo, their white cat. They found him about two years ago, or more specifically, Zuku found him during one of his patrols. No one wanted him, the main reason being his face. Pablo was one serious case of animal cruelty. Someone sliced the corners of his mouth, and thanks to that, his face looks like he always has a Cheshire cat smile on it. Add this to the ears that look almost like horns and eyes that always seem to be judging you, and you have possibly the scariest cat in existence. And Pablo also has the power to back up his scariness. He's one of the rare animals with a quirk. Zuko learned this the hard way. When he met the cat, he was wary of everything and everyone. When Zuko tried to approach it, he felt a headache similar to when he overused his quirk. It took weeks of leaving food for the cat until Zuku gained his trust enough to approach him without being attacked. Pablo's quirk was named aneurysm. A mental quirk activated by eye contact, the cat can make the target feel severe headaches, and if held too long, it can even cause a stroke. Guess no one needs to mention how dangerous this quirk is. But even with all this, for Shouta and Izuku, this cat is simply the sweetest thing they know, and they will fight anyone who says otherwise. Hey, sweetie. Zuku said, kneeling next to the cat, who instantly jumped on his arms and started rubbing his head against Zuku's face. I'm fine now, don't worry. No, Zu, you aren't. Kuzu interrupted him. Will you tell me what happened? Dad asked. Will you keep calm? Zuku asked back. Zuku knows that his dad will be angry when he hears what happened. But he doesn't want him to expel Katsuki. Was the blonde cruel with his words? Yes, he was. Did he hurt Zuku? Not physically, but he did. But Katsuki has much more than a powerful quirk. He has the potential to be a great hero, and he'll never have the chance to do it if his dad expels him because of this single event. I'll try to. And it's the most he'll get from Mizawa. Still, Zuku will try. So, as calmly as he can, Zuku explains what happened after his dad left. He even manages not to start crying when he says the words that hurt so much to hear. He said what but clearly, the words bothered his dad. For all the talk of acting logically, Tetsawa is always the first to lose his cool when something affects Izuku. It's usually something sweet to see, but Zuku wanted it to be different at this particular moment. He said, why aren't you dead? Not helping, Kuzu. Among other things. He's so expelled. Dad said, already pulling his phone, probably to call Netsu, but Zuku held his wrist before he could. Stop, dad please. Zuku said, already crying. Zuku, I said he would be expelled if he tried anything. Dad replied. He said you would expel him if he attacked us. He didn't. Zuku argued. Physically not. But he still hurt you, Zuku. Verbal abuse is as bad as physical abuse. Dad said back. We can't just let this go. Zuku. Stop, please. Kuzu interrupted. He doesn't deserve your forgiveness. Not if he doesn't apologize. I know, but. Please, Zu. He already hurt you too much. He's not your friend. You don't owe him anything, kid. Zuku knows it. Deep down, he knows it. The memories of when Izuku and Katsuki were four years old and attached by the hip are just that, memories. Logically, he knows that the only reason he doesn't resent the blonde is that he is incapable of feeling anger. After all, Kuzu clearly resents him. But at this point, it is precisely because he is incapable of feeling anger that Zuku knows he can be logical. Yes, he doesn't owe Katsuki anything. If he hates Izuku, it's a shame, but Zuku will survive without his childhood friend. However, that doesn't mean that Zuku will let all his chances be destroyed because of this. Reluctantly, Zuku let go of his dad's wrist. But he didn't give up. Please dad. I know you saw his potential. Just give him a chance to change. Zuku argued again. You don't need to forgive him, neither you nor Kuzu need to. You don't need to let this slide, you can give him another form of punishment, like detention. You can make him have counseling within you Sen. His dad pondered for a few seconds, really pondered, then he looked at him with a serious expression. At this moment, this wasn't his dad. This was Eraserhead. Why? He asked. Why should I give him a chance? Because if you don't, no one will. Zuku replied in an equally serious tone. I know what he did. I am not forgetting, nor just forgiving. But I know if someone can help him be better, it's you dad. Kuzu. Eraserhead asked. I don't want to forgive him. He hurts you too much. Kuzu said, then sighed. But Zu is not wrong either. If we just expel him, he'll never learn to be better. He could be a great hero, with the right guidance. And at that, Racer had sighed, then his expression softened as he put a hand on Izuku's head and ruffled their hair. You too. I'm proud of you. Dad said, smiling at them. I'll give him a chance. But it'll be his last. Thank you, Dad. Zuku said, hugging him. He'll need to follow a few rules if he wants to stay. Dad continued. First one is, he'll treat you with respect. If I hear him calling you Deku again, he's out. 
I'll be giving him a week of detention, and he'll have mandatory counseling with Hound Dog. Let me talk to him too, Kuzu said. I have something to say. Fine. But I'll be close this time. Dad replied. That's fine by me. Kuzu grinned. I just want to talk to him. As much as I'm sure he deserves. I won't let you kill him. Nah, don't worry, Dad. Kuzu replied. It's not like I'm trying to sneak Pablo into the school. Please don't. Zuku pleaded, and the cat purred at the same time. You know Pablo won't hesitate to kill someone if we ask. You remember what happened when that thief tried to invade. I remember how it took Dad two hours to notice we had an unconscious man in our living room. Kuzu teased. I had just returned from my patrol and hadn't had my nap yet. Dad defended. Aren't you the one who is always talking about situational awareness? On another note, Dad tried to change the subject. But the red ears were obvious. Tomorrow will be the first heroics class. Great. A full class with all more. Kuzu replied. I can't wait to be ignored the entire day. All Might is a good person and a great hero. But he has one fatal flaw. The imbecile always thinks he knows everything, and as a result, he ignores everyone's opinion. In class tomorrow, Zuku won't be surprised if he completely ignores the script and puts the students in some dangerous situation like battles with quirks before any training or safety instruction. Did Majima Sensei something about our new costume? Zuku asked. He said it will be ready by tomorrow. Dad replied. He also said he finished most of your support gear. Finally. I can't believe we've been doing this for more than a year, and just now the commission approved our costume. Kuzu huffed. Honestly, one would think after getting a license you would get better gear than when we were vigilante, but knew him. Better late than never, I guess. Zuku shrugged. Anyway. I'm exhausted and we don't have to patrol today, so I'll go to sleep. Don't stay up too late Kuzu. Then less than 5 minutes later, Kuzu felt Zuku sleeping in their mind. Kuzu almost followed him up, but then he felt his phone vibrating. He got a new message, and he knew exactly from whom. Riddington House. Are you free? Crazy not crazy. Maybe. Is it important? Riddington House. Would I be messaging you if it wasn't? Crazy not crazy. Fair enough. Same place as always. Riddington House. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Also, prepare for a donation. She's hungry. Crazy not crazy. Okay. Dad. Kuzu called, and Shadow looked at him. I'm going out for a while. I need to meet my adult problem. Be careful. Dad replied, handing him a pot of burn ointment. Great, so he knows exactly who Kuzu is talking about. I'll be. Kuzu chirped, already moving for the door, picking his coat, then putting on his red shoes. These shoes, to this day, are still something that never fails to sour his mood. As someone who has been quirkless, Izuku knows better than anyone what they mean. It's pretty simple. Quirkless people have an extra joint in their pinky toe, so normal shoes don't fit them comfortably. Quirkless people are about 20% of the population, but something that isn't usually considered is that this number has been dropping with each generation. That is to say, in fact, 20% of the world's population is quirkless, but most of these people are in the elder groups. If we think only of those under 30, this percentage would be something like 2% of the population. Making shoes for such a small group is certainly not very profitable, so most companies don't even consider it. In fact, only one company manufactures the so-called primordial shoes in all of Japan. And that is not the problem. The problem is that the company owner is basically a quirkiest of the worst possible string. His motive for making the primordial shoes is not at all noble. All the primordial shoes are made in the same bright red model. So that anyone on the street can identify someone quirkless just by looking at their feet. And since no other company even considers making shoes for the quirkless, it's either that or go barefoot, which would be just as obvious even if it were a good idea. The purpose is obvious. It would be easier to make all quirkless people walk around with a sign on their chest or something. Izuku may be a false positive, but they still have the extra joint. Yes, Majima-san would be more than happy to make shoes adapted for him if they asked. He made boots for his costume, after all. But he doesn't do that. On the contrary, Izuku makes a point of continuing to wear primordial shoes. Simply to prove a point. Izuku is not the first false positive to exist, nor will he be the last. They are rare, but they still exist. This whole thing about the extra joint is completely outdated nonsense. It is much more superstition than anything else. Practically anyone with some kind of bird mutation has the joint. It is a natural part of their anatomy. One of Izuku's biggest battles is to make everyone aware of this fact. This is why they are entirely open about being a false positive. That is why they always wear primordial shoes. But that doesn't mean they like them. Hell. If Izuku earned a coin every time someone twisted their nose at them or crossed the street after looking down and seeing red shoes, Izuku could retire and buy a mansion in the best city in Japan. This is, of course, ignoring the less discreet, who said words that should not be repeated. But now is not the time to think about that. Kuzu needs to go out to meet a friend. Then about 20 minutes after leaving the house, Kuzu finds himself in a dark alley. The usual place. 
Looking around, there was still no one there, so Kuzu simply decided to wait. And he doesn't have to wait long before he hears a sound and turns around just in time to catch, between two fingers, a knife flying towards his face. Oh, I thought I got you. A female voice, too animated, said. You're no fun, Ku-chan. Hi to you too, Himi-chan. Kuzu sighed, already opening his arms to the blonde girl that instantly tackled him into a hug. Animated as always. A deeper voice called, and a dark-haired male entered the alley after the girl. Dobby. How is my favorite arsonist doing? Kuzu chirped, injecting as much sarcasm in his words as he could. It had to be effort. Dobby mumbled. Where's your brother? Sleeping. Kuzu replied, tapping his head with his index finger. Long day. Then he turned to the blonde girl. And I heard you were hungry. It's been three days already. She said. Alright, not criticizing. Kuzu replied, starting to pull off his jacket. Then he turned his back to the girl. Try not to cause a mess, please. I like this shirt. And watch out for the artery. The girl instantly perked up and buried her teeth into Kuzu's neck, it stung a bit, but he's more than used to that. With that, he addressed Dobby. So, what did you need to say? He asked. Well, I thought you should know, since you're working at UA now. Dobby said while pulling a cigar, and Kuzu held a flaming finger for him. There's this new group calling themselves the League of Villains. That's been recruiting tugs everywhere. Tugs? Kuzu asked, raising an eyebrow. Anyone with any kind of criminal past. From a pickpocket, to a murderer Dobby explained. They tried to approach me in Toga. Himiko. Himiko called, then sank her teeth back into Kuzu's neck. Himiko. Dobby sighed. Their leader wants to kill All Might. And since All Might works at UA now, they have an opportunity to attack, and potential hostages to use. Kuzu said. Well, this is amazing. The tugs are probably cannon fodder. Dobby continued. But their leader seemed really confident they'll succeed. Thinking about All Might's condition, Kuzu couldn't not be worried. Could these villains be aware of his weakened form? But how could they? If you're telling me this, I suppose you didn't accept his offer. Kuzu replied. Of course not. Dobby said, indignant. I want to kill Endeavor, not All Might. And you don't want to attack your little brother's class. Kuzu smirked at him. Shut up, Brett. Dobby muttered. Have you considered my offer? Kuzu asked again. I did, and just like I said last time. It's impossible. Dobby replied. I'm not even a vigilante, Ifrit. You are. Kuzu replied. You use your court to attack other villains, this makes you a vigilante. Still impossible. For now. Kuzu sighed. It's slow work, Dobby. But we are getting close. Endeavor will fall. And then, I promise you, I'll bring you back to your family. I wish I could trust you, Ifrit. Dobby said sorrowfully. I really wish. But this is Endeavor we are talking about. True, but even Endeavor can't outsmart Netsu. Kuzu replied. So please. Don't give up yet. As long as you don't go full villain, I can bring you into the Project Vigilante. The same goes to you, Himi-chan. So just avoid murder, and stay low. Alright. I'll trust you for now. Dobby said, then pulled an envelope from his coat. And here is the information you asked last week. He's really hard to find. If he wasn't he would have been caught already. Kuzu replied. But there's only so much a vigilante turned villain can do to stay hidden. Especially if they keep acting. Thank you Tuya. Don't mention. Dobby replied, smiling slightly. Hey, Himiko, you'll suck him dry. That's what she said. Kuzu giggled. How mature. Dobby said, as Himiko let go of Kuzu's neck. Thank you. Himiko said as she helped Kuzu put a bandage on the place she had just bitten. No problem. Kuzu said. Now, I need to go home before dad gets too worried. Oh, Dobby, this is from dad. He gave Dobby the burn ointment. I can attest to his efficiency. Let's see. Dobby replied. Sleep well, Brad. I'll contact you if I learn anything new. I, Kuchan. Say hi to Zuzu for me. Himiko chirped, and then they both left. Well, this honestly went much better than Kuzu expected. It seems like Dobby is really opening to them. And Kuzu will be damned if he betrays this trust. One way or another, Endeavor will fall. Thichi's second day at UA started almost like the first. Hitashi arrived at the classroom 15 minutes before homeroom started. And, by force of habit, scanned the entire room before entering. It's always been like that for him. The only difference from the first day was that Poltergeist wasn't sitting at the ceiling this time, and Bakugu wasn't in the room yet. Whatever, he doesn't care, so he just goes to his desk, sits down, and proceeds to nap until homeroom starts. Five minutes before homeroom begins, Bakugu enters the room, wearing an expression stuck between annoyed and fearful, interesting. He goes straight to his desk and sits down without another word. He doesn't even yell when the redeed with shark teeth tries to talk with him. Then, soon after that, Izuku enters the room. Hitashi takes a second to look in his eyes, trying to see which one is that. Yellow eyes, so this must be Kuzu, right? Unlike yesterday, today, he was not wearing his hero costume. 
Instead, he was wearing a UA uniform like any other student would. That is, if you ignore the tie that appears to have been tied by a right-handed person who has two left hands. Life can be funny at times. Racer had has always been Hitachi's favorite hero and still is, but duality easily takes second place, mainly because of his involvement in anti-discrimination campaigns. After finding out about the NGOs they talked about on the radio program, Hitachi went after them. And what did he find out? Apparently, Ifrit and Poltergeist constantly donate 80% of everything they earn to these NGOs focused on fighting discrimination, and openly take a stand against any kind of prejudice, be it against mutation quirks, villainous or quirkless. It didn't take long for the duo to become the second best hero, in his opinion. And now, their favorite heroes have become their teachers. Frankly, few things are more incredible. Scanning the room, Kuzu grinned at Hitachi for a second, then sat down at Azawa's desk. Just like yesterday, Azawa's sensei seems to immediately teleport to the room's door the moment the signal rings. This time, the room immediately falls silent and watches him. Five seconds, that's better. Azawa's sensei nods at the class, which almost bursts into cheers, but a single glare with glowing eyes and floating hair silences them. From there, an incredibly normal day follows up. Homeroom with Azawa. Mathematics with ectoplasm. Science with snow. Then lunch. After that, it's study hall, again with Azawa. And then it's time for fundamentals of heroics. Before the class started, most of the students were theorizing about who would teach this subject. Izuka looked like they wanted to be dead, which obviously meant it wouldn't be Izawa. So who could it be? I am here. Oh. There's no mistaking this force. Coming through the door each word made Izuka look like he was sinking more in his chair. Seems like All Might isn't his favorite teacher. Like a normal person. The day I see a normal person walk through the door like this will be the day I know that humanity is beyond salvation. Kuzu mumbled to himself, and Hitachi had to hold his snickering. As All Might started introducing himself, Izuka looked about to start headbanging his desk. Especially when All Might introduced their costumes. No hero is a real hero without his hero costume. He announced with a dramatic tone, and clicking a button on a remote, draws popped out of the wall with a hiss, numbered cases coming out along with them. Well, Hitachi understands where he's coming from. But isn't Sir Night Eye's hero costume basically a formal suit? The costume might be important, but he makes it sound like it's the most important thing. Well, at least the class is excited to see their costumes. Hitachi is excited too. He can't deny it. And for some reason, All Might had an extra case in his hands. Young Izawa. He called Izuku. I said to call me Izuku's side again. He's doing that a lot today. Forget. He waves a hand. Er? How Lover said to give this to you. He passed the case to Izuku. Finally. Izuku replied, smiling. Now. If I'm not wrong, our class today will be at Jingama. Not quite, young Izawa. All Might said, and Izuku's smile instantly dropped. We'll be going to Ground Beta. And Izuku visibly scowled at that. Ground Beta. What are you planning, All Might? Kuzu asked, gritting his teeth. We'll be doing combat training. All Might said like it should be obvious. On the first day. Without any prior training. Kuzu asked in his most deadpan expression. At least tell me it will be quirkless training. What would be the point? All Might asked, tilting his head to the side. Kuzu took a long deep breath, then started talking slowly. The point, All Might, is to not let 19 super powerful teens freely use their quirks against each other without any previous training in how to do it safely. Kuzu replied. Experience is the best teacher, young Izawa. Don't worry. All Might waved off his concerns. You know what? I give up. Kuzu said, then turned to the class. Suit up and follow him, I'll be back soon. Then he left. Where is he going? Kaminari asked. But the question everyone had at this moment was another. Will we really be okay? But of course, it had to be all Moron. What kind of idiot thinks such a lesson plan is a good idea? Izuku watched Izawa's quirk assessment test firsthand. He analyzed each of the students. Apart from two, no one there has any kind of adequate training to be doing combat training. Most of them probably can't even understand how dangerous their quirks really are. Today it should just be a review, test, and critique of the costumes. Dad is already at Jim Gamma waiting, after all. That's where they should be going. With his costume case in hand, Zuku decided that, to hell with it, and simply rose from the ground flying at full speed toward the Jim Gamma. Bad Data had forgotten his phone. He almost crashes against the door in his hurry. Dad. He's already yelling, which startles Shouta, who barely keeps himself from jumping. Izuku would be laughing in any other situation, but now they have a disaster to prevent. Zuku. What happened? Dad asked worriedly. All more unhappened. Zuku replied. He changed the schedule. The class isn't coming here. Where are they going? Dad asked hesitantly. Brown Beta. Zuku replied. He wants to do combat training. Combat training? Zuku could practically see his dad's soul leaving his body. Damn it. What is he thinking? I have been working here for two days, and I already want to ask for a raise. 
Taking care of an almost 50-year-old child was not in the job description. Zuku fascinated. Anyway, we need to run. Because there's no way this won't end with broken bones, at the very least. Can I carry you? It will be the fastest way. Dad nodded. Then Zuku carefully lifted his dad and took flight again, full speed towards ground beta. When they arrived, only All Might was there. Which means the students must be changing. At least no, they didn't start yet. It looks like we're just in time. Go put on your costume. I'll take care of the imbecile. Dad said, then Zuku nodded. He entered the changing room just in time to hear his father kicking the door open. Dramatic as always. The sound of the kick must have been louder than expected because the moment Izuku enters the changing room, everyone looks between him and the door with expressions caught between surprise, confusion, and fear. As always having a little conversation with All Might. No need to worry. Zuku said with a sweet smile that soon became a mischievous smirk when his eyes turned yellow. Actually, I'll bring a batch of cookies for whoever records the conversation and sends me the video afterwards. Kuzu said as he passed through the boys to start putting on his costume. Most of the boys had already changed and were just waiting for the rest. Zuku almost stopped for a moment to look at their clothes, but decided to leave the analysis for a few minutes. When he ended Zawa will do the critiques. But with a simple glance over it, he already knows a lot will have to be changed. Okay. Go ahead, I'll meet you guys soon. Zuku said, waving. A few seconds later, everyone started leaving the changing room, some more skittish than others. Zuku could faintly hear his dad's voice from outside as he spoke to All Might. Then Izuku put down their case and opened it carefully, already grinning at his costume. They've been waiting for years for this. They finally have a real hero costume, and it seems that Majima-san didn't hold back on it. First, the costume consisted of a jumpsuit, similar to his dad's ya. Izuku asked specifically for it, sue him, and with the same reinforcements to protect his vital parts. The right half of the suit was red, and the left half was black, with a circular switch in the chest region. Next, the boots were a simple and functional pair of combat boots, the left boot was red, and the right boot was black, opposing the suit's colors. The soles had several holes, perfect for the flames. Fingerless knuckle gloves, in the same pattern as the boots, the black half of the costume, wears the red glove, and the red half wears the black glove. Two bracelets, following the color pattern of the suit. A briefcase with five arrows, darts, some bottles of different colors, two cameras, about the size of a marble bowl, and a set of six rings and a slightly larger one. Plus some basics, like capture tape, first aid kit, energetic cereal bar for night patrols. The black cloak, with several pockets on the inside, similar to the one they always use. The difference being that the button that fastens it is shaped like a skull. Nice detail. At last but not least, the mask. The skull mask has become their main symbol. There's no way Izuku would change it now. And of course, Majima-san did a fantastic job with it. The style of the mask is the same as the one Izuku has always worn. But with a bonus, protected eyes. There was also a tiny button on the side of each eye. Quickly putting on his clothes, Izuku continued to look through the case. A note explaining the features of the costume and support gear. Hello Izuku. Sorry for the delay, but I finally finished your costume. As you requested, the costume can freely change between you two as you wish. Just turn the switch on the chest. Right for black, left for red, and center for bicolor. Testing it, when Izuku turned the switch to the left, the suit, boots, and gloves turned completely black. Then, turning it to the right, it became black. Perfect. Grinning under his mask, Izuku turned it back to the center, and the suit went back to the original half black, half red. Then he looked back at the note. The gloves are for effort. They have plating in the knuckles for extra punching and protection, and they are heat conductive. The entire costume and support gear must be able to easily resist up to blue flames, but I didn't find a way to make it resist your purple flames yet. The cloak was the simplest part. I kept the original design of your cloak and only added a few details. The black color should absorb any light, so you will be untraceable in the dark, unless the person has some sort of detection quirk. The inside is full of pockets to store your gadgets. The arrows we talked about are stored in the case. 5 arrows, they must be durable enough to withstand yellow flames without melting. But take it easy. The vials, be careful with them, okay. The blue one is a tranquilizing drug. The yellow is paralyzing. The darts are hollow, so you can put the drug inside them. The moment they pierce the target, the drug is released. The dosage can be adjusted. The transparent bottle has a flammable liquid. Coat the arrow, then apply a small flame, and boom. Flaming arrow. The coating should last about 10 minutes. Simply wrap the arrow in your cloak if you need to put out the fire sooner. The oxygen cut should extinguish the fire instantly. The rings. Press them against the person, and they will trap them like handcuffs. Since you said, it's harder to hold on to humans or animals when they are resisting. They are designed to attach to key areas of the body. The recommendation is wrists, shoulders, ankles, and knees. The largest ring is for the neck. The mask is reinforced, so it should give your face some protection, but it's not too much, so be careful. The eyes are protected, and the glass is one way only. 
If you press the switch on the chest, the eyes will glow in the color your suit currently is. And the mouth can open up so you can breathe fire through it. I made it to detect when you open your mouth in the right way. The buttons on your mask work together with the cameras. You will see an R and an L on each camera. The R camera is connected to the button on the right, the L to the button on the left. Press the button, and the camera starts recording. Any recording will be transmitted directly to the corresponding eye in the mask, besides keeping a copy of the recording on the memory card that I have installed in the hood of your cloak. Be careful. An electric shock will fry the cameras instantly. The video recording will be safe, but these cameras are difficult to build. Finally, the bracelets. These gave me a little trouble, but I managed to make them just as you wanted. They are strong enough to be used as a blockade against blade and bullet attacks. But that's not what you wanted them for. Your chains were adapted and placed inside them as you wanted. It was very hard to find an alloy strong enough to keep the chains thin, light and practical. You owe me coffee for this one. To launch the chains, you must make specific movements. Just press your fingers on the palms, and they come back. Make a drawing motion from the shoulders, and it will launch the neutral chains. They are as heavy as Namiri's whip, and should hold as much as your dad's scarf. Make a drawing motion from the waist, and you will throw the flammable chains, one tiny spark, and the whole chain will catch fire. Throwing your arm, like you want to stab something, you throw the grappling hook. The tip of the chain is tipped like a dagger, and as soon as it pierces something, it will open into a hook to attach to the pierced surface. That's the gist of it. If you need any adjustments or changes, you come straight to me, right? Absolutely under no circumstances are you to interact with the pink-haired girl named Hatsune. Hatsune. This name is familiar. Where did Izuku hear it before? Oh, well, they can look at it later. For now, Izuku finished putting on the bracelets and the cloak. Then he slid the vials and arrows in the pockets of his cloak, in the waistline, together with a few other utility things, like a first aid kit. And of course, there is no shortage of space for jelly pouches. What? He's his always son. Of course, he eats, drinks, this stuff. He keeps the suit in the neutral position and goes back to the ground beta to meet the rest of the class. And they enter just in time to see Golden Scene. All Might look pale as a ghost, and every single person in the room seems either confused, terrified, or both. While Dad is simply standing there with his neutral expression. No, scratch that. His lips are curved half a millimeter upwards. The bastard is loving the scene. Kuzu is really hoping someone recorded what happened. Meeting his dad's eyes, Izuku tilted his head in All Might's direction, but Shouta simply shrugged. Now that everyone is here, let's start with the combat training. Shouta said with as much disdain as he could. Since All Might has assured me that nothing will go wrong, I'll just be watching. He gave a pointed look at All Might, and Izuku is sure he saw the giant man shiver, and his right hand twitched for a second. Now that you're all ready, we can start. All Might said. Sir? Nita shouted, raising his hand. All Might nodded. This is the fake city from our entrance exam. Does that mean that we'll be conducting urban battles again? Not quite. I'm going to move you two steps ahead. Oh, Izuku doesn't like where this is going. Most of the villain fights you see on the news take place outside. However, statistically speaking, run-ins with the most dastardly of Vildors take place indoors. All Might explained proudly, and Izuku can't help the shiver he's feeling at where this is going. We won't be using robots this time. Which can only mean one thing. And it's bad. Sir, will you be the one deciding who wins? Ida asked. Do we need to worry about the losers getting expelled like earlier? Yuraka asked. Will you be splitting us up based on chance or comparative skill? Hiyoi Rosu asked. Isn't this cake beautiful? Aoyama asked, and at that, Izuku blinked and looked at the boy. Yeah, it's a cool cape, but it doesn't look practical. Mental note for later. Calm down, calm down. I'll explain everything in a second. Then All Might put on a pair of glasses hot, what do you know? And a goddamn script. Couldn't even memorize his lesson plan. Really. The situation is this. The villains have hidden a nuclear missile somewhere in their hideout. The heroes must try to foil their plans. The class to quiet it down by then. To do that, the good guys either have to catch the Vildors or recover the weapon. Likewise, the bad guys succeed if they protect their payload or capture the heroes. Dad looked torn between trying not to laugh and trying not to fasten. Izuka rarely felt as tired as his dad, but this is one of those times. We'll be deciding the teams by drawing lots. Isn't there a better way? Ida asked. It's logical if you think about it. Gyoi Rosa replied to him. Most of the time pro heroes have to team up with heroes from other agencies on the spot. Yes, it makes sense. Pro heroes rarely get to choose who they team up with. But something this something being All Might's confused face tells Izuku this isn't the reason All Might decided to do it this way. Anyway, with the explanation out of the way, they started drawing the teams. As it said, the draws were mostly random, but the last team wasn't. Dad made sure that those three would be last and paired together. Why? Because Zuku asked him for a chance to observe them closer. Tokoyami Fumikage, Todoroki Shadow, and Kaminari Denki. 
Due to the expulsion of a student, the options were for someone to fight alone or for a team to have three people. Therefore, these three will form a team. Sensei. Kaminari raised his hand. All the teams are paired already. Will someone fight twice? No, Yun Kaminari. All Might replied. Instead, your team will face another person. Me? Zuku chirped. Exactly. The last battle will be Young Tokoyami, Todoroki and Kaminari, against Young Izawa. All Might said. Wait, they'll face a pro hero. Ashido asked. Is that fair? Absolutely not. Zuku replied. That's why we are making it fair. He raised his hand, showing three fingers. They'll be fighting as a trio, Kuzu won't participate, only me. At last, I'll be fighting Quirkless. How will you fight without your quirk? Yida asked. Isn't that too dangerous? At this statement, Zuku simply lifted his mask, showing his face to the students. Don't underestimate the quirkless, Yida Khan. Zuku said, grinning. You regret it. This combat exercise went a little better than Izuku expected. Not that it's surprising, their expectation was so low that the surprise would be if it didn't go better than he expected. But to be fair, even with Izawa having let All Might get on with his lesson plan, he made sure to give the class a big lecture on cell control, caution, and safety. And, probably out of fear of the hobo teacher, most took the warnings seriously. After all, nobody wants to be expelled. Thankfully, most students suffered only light wounds. The first match was Siro and Hagakura's heroes, against Ashido and Kirishima as villains. Siro discovered just how corrosive Ashido's acid is, and that his tape is a horrible matchup against it. But thankfully, he just had some light burns, and Hagakur was simply made for this task. The moment she ended in the hero's team, the exercise was basically won. Sadly, since Kirishima never saw Hagakur approaching, he never got to even start showing how he fights. Nobody had any doubt when the MVP went to Hagakur. Shinsu and Yuraka as heroes, against Saida and Bakugu as villains, went better than Izuku expected. Once more, Shinsu proved how much he deserves to be there, when he tricked Bakugu into replying to him and activated his quirk. In a show of coordination and strategy, Shinsu used Bakugu's explosions to break the floor where Ida was guarding the bomb. And Yuraka used the opportunity to touch and float Ida to the ceiling and capture the bomb. A great show of teamwork. And again, everyone agreed to consider Shinsu the MVP, since the plan was basically his. Except Shinsu himself, who tried to say it should be Yuraka. Mental note. Build Shinsu's self-confidence ASAP. The victim of this match was Yuraka, who had to go to the infirmary after her breakfast decided to drop by to say hello drawback of her quirk. Saku and Ajiro as heroes, against Kuda and Jiro as villains, was really interesting. There weren't any animals that Kuda could call for help. But with the help of Jiro's quirk, they made a sound like a dog's whistle that called dozens of birds to help them. Again a great show of teamwork and creativity. Satu and Ajiro fought well, each in their own style, but as soon as Satu's sugar started to run out, they ended up overwhelmed by the swarm of birds and lost. This time, the MVP went to both Kuda and Jiro. No one was hurt too badly here, but Ajiro and Satu may have developed a healthy fear of birds. Asui and Shaoji as heroes, against Yerozu and Aoyama as villains, could have gone better. Asui and Shaoji, showed great synergy between Shaoji's brute strength with his six arms, and Asui frog-like agility. Yerozu and Aoyama were a bit less coordinated. Aoyama was too distracted by his cape and was ambushed and captured early on. From there, Yerozu barricaded herself inside the room with the bomb and used offensive strategies to buy time. With flash grenades, barricades and well-placed traps, she almost won by herself. However, with a well-matched joint attack, Shaoji managed to distract her long enough for Asui to be able to jump over her and reach the bomb in the last 10 seconds. Despite losing, Yerozu deservedly took the MVP of the match. This was the cleanest match of all, no one suffered more than a few scratches. After each match, Azawa commented on the key points, as well as offering criticism on what could be improved. After this, the last match was about to begin. Zuku as hero, against Kaminari, Tokoyami, and Todoroki as villains. As agreed, Kuzu will be sitting this one out, and Zuku will be fighting Quirkless. Also, in this exercise, the villains clearly have an advantage, since they have 5 minutes to scout the area, and chose where to hide the bomb. All Might said that true heroes must be able to adapt to any kind of situation, and he's not wrong. But still, this is too advanced for first years. Izuku had 4 years of experience as a vigilante, and even so, his dad only let him take part in this kind of practice in his second year of training. To regular students, this probably would be something that a third year would do. At least no one broke anything. Though this is probably more because most of them hold back a bit in fear of Ditsawa. As soon as the starting signal went off, Zuku sat down, waiting for the 5 minutes and forming his strategy in the meantime. The reason Izuku took an interest in these three right away is quite simple. In terms of brute strength, these three have the strongest quirks in the class. However, the more powerful the quirk, the more difficult it is to control. Todoroki's quirk is half hot, half cold. An elemental quirk that allows him to generate fire from half of his body and ice from the other half. 
incredibly powerful, and with him being the youngest Todoroki, and with Izuku knowing what he knows about Tuya, a lot of red flags are being raised here. But the talk about abuse will have to wait for later, now Izuku needs to see how familiar Todoroki is with his quirk. Tokoyami's quirk is Dark Shadow. A sentient quirk, in the form of a raven made of shadows. The mere fact that it is sentient should make it extremely difficult to control. But the name Dark Shadow already gives Izuku some ideas of what their strengths and weaknesses might be. Kaminari's quirk is Electrification. An emitter quirk that allows him to use electricity to attack, and frankly, the scariest of the bunch. If Kaminari has good control of his quirk he can easily be one of the strongest in the class. However if he doesn't have good control it can be very dangerous for him. Taking a deep breath, Izuku stands up and prepares his gear. Taking two darts, he puts the sleeping drug in one and the paralyzing drug in the other, then reduces the dosage to the minimum. He checks the bracelets, making sure they are working as intended. His costume is left all black, and his eyes are deactivated. Yungazawa, time is up. You can go in now. All Might called through the communicator. Instead of running through the door or window, Zuka calmly walks along the side of the building, following the visible electricity wiring to the power box. Grabbing his pocket knife, Izuku quickly opens the box and cuts all the wires, effectively shutting down all the power in the building, and turning off all the lights. Everyone knows how limelight heroes fight, break in through the front door, and smash everything in their path. The more show off the better. But what Izuku will show everyone are the tactics of an underground hero. If he can inspire some students, all the better. Next, Zuku throws his grappling hook just below the second floor window and climbs up to it. He hears a voice from inside and stops before entering. It's all out. It's Kaminari's voice. But no sign of him. Todoroki is still with the bomb, right? Indeed, he is. This is Tokoyami. And he'll freeze the entire building any second now if someone doesn't stop him. The entire building what a show off. Kaminari joked. If he does, we'll be caught on his attack too. Well, he doesn't seem to care. A third voice called. Oh, it's Dark Shadow. And frankly, I want to fight too. Behave, Shadow. Tokoyami chided. Let's check the next floor. He might have climbed through a window. Alright, I'll stay here and then Kaminari stopped. No, no sign of him. Oh, he's talking to Todoroki. It must be communicator. I'm on the second floor, and Tokoyami is about to go check the third. A few seconds pass again. Alright, we'll try. Rebel in the darkness. Tokoyami calls and starts walking again. Zuku waits a few seconds in case someone comes back, then enters through the window. Thanks to the window, it is not too dark, but a few rooms inside, there's much less light, which is perfect for Zuku to hide. As expected, Kaminari is patrolling the area, his quirk sparking around his body, making it glow. A good strategy, since he doesn't have a flashlight. But it also shows exactly his position. The fastest knockdown would be to hit him with a sleeping dart. Zuku sneaks closer to him, taking the dart in his hand, and stops just behind Kaminari. He approaches the arrow to the back of his neck, then stops, puts the dart away, and instead lightly touches Kaminari's shoulder. In a real situation, you would already have been caught. He said, then jumped back when Kaminari turned to look at him, already hiding in the shadows again. What the where are you? He asked. Zuku, smiling under his mask, started circling him through the room. He pressed the switch in his suit, activating the glowing eyes. I'm right here, villain Kung. Zuku said in a teasing tone, then deactivated the eyes again and jumped out of the way of Kaminari's charge. You're too slow. Want to try again? Okay, try to dodge that one. Kaminari said, joining his hands, Zuku saw the electricity crawling through Kaminari's body, then he directed all to the floor. Indiscriminate shock 1.3 million volts. And then, there was electricity flying everywhere. Zuku quickly aimed his grappling hook to the ceiling and reeled, avoiding the attack completely. Okay. I have to admit. This is pretty powerful but Zuku stopped talking when he saw Kaminari's face. The boy had a hollow expression, and was walking around with two thumbs up and making an unrecognizable sound. What? Are you okay, Kaminari-kun? He dropped back to the floor and walked closer, but Kaminari didn't react. Oh, god. Did you just short-circuited your brain? Again no response. We need to correct this ASAP. Zuku mumbled, then took the capture tape from his cloak, and gently wrapped it around Kaminari's waist, then tied it to a wall. Kaminari Denki is captured. All Might announced. Now, I need to keep going. Tokoyami or Todoroki will be checking this place soon. Zuku mumbled, then, giving Kaminari a last glance to make sure he was okay, he moved on. Finding the stairs to the next floor was quite easy. But instead of climbing, Zuku opted to wait. His patience was soon rewarded, when he heard footsteps approaching. A single person, the footsteps almost inaudible, which indicates that it is someone light. Probably Tokoyami, he must have bones like those of birds, which would make him quite light for someone that size. 
when he arrives, instead of immediately looking for Zuku, Tokoyami leaves the dark room as quickly as possible, immediately going to one of the windowed rooms. Interesting choice, if Zuku's hunch is correct, dark shadow becomes stronger in dark places, so why give up this advantage? Following Tokoyami, he overhears a conversation. Calm down, shadow. We can't lose ourselves in a situation like this. But Fumi, I want to fight. This is the perfect situation. Dark shadow whined. Zuku grinned under his mask and started walking closer. What an interesting thing he just overheard. Interesting, want to tell me more? He said, and two pair of eyes instantly snapped to him. Tokoyami seemed shocked for a moment, and Dark Shadow instantly lunged to attack Zuku. Zuku sidestepped, and Dark Shadow hit the wall behind him, destroying it instantly. Powerful, what else do you have, little bird? Zuku teased, and Dark Shadow lunged again. This time Zuku crouched avoiding the hit again, then took a few steps back. Calm down, Shadow, don't fall for his provocation. Tokoyami tried to reason, but Dark Shadow was ignoring him. After a few seconds, Zuku saw Tokoyami being dragged closer. There must be a limit to the distance the Dark Shadow can travel from Tokoyami. If Zuku is going to take a guess, about 5 meters. Come on, little bird. Catch me if you can. Zuku provoked again, going deeper into the darkness. Oh, you won't escape. Dark Shadow said, and lunged again. This time faster, and stronger. The darker it is, the stronger he, or is she. They. I'll have to ask later. Anyway the darker it is the bigger and stronger Dark Shadow becomes. Zuku mumbled to himself, avoiding another attack. But it seems they get more aggressive, and straightforward too. Very predictable, we will have to work on this problem. Then Izuku made a drawing motion starting from his waist, and each bracelet shot a chain. Swinging both chains, Zuku hit one on the other, drawing a spark that ignited the whole chain. Dark Shadow instantly shrieked and backed away from the flames. Zuku then pressed the fingers of his left hand against his palm, pulling back the chain, keeping only the one in his right hand. And with his left he quickly pulled out one of the darts. Swinging the chain, he made Dark Shadow retreat even further, and taking advantage of the momentum, he threw the dart, hitting Tokoyami's opposite forearm, who immediately stopped moving and fell to the ground. What kind of sorcery is this? Tokoyami asked from the floor. Not sorcery. Science. Zuku chirped. I applied a minimal dosage, so you should be able to move again within 5 minutes. Then Zuku approached and gently picked up Tokoyami in his arms. I will have to capture you now, but I will leave you in a place with more light. Then Zuku went into the room with the windows where they had started fighting, and gently placed Tokoyami on the floor against the wall. Then he opened all the windows. Thank you. Tokoyami said softly as Zuku approached him with the capture tape. Don't worry. I know how it is to be afraid of the dark. Zuku said, lifting his mask to show him his smile. Then he took two jelly pouches from his cloak and placed them on the ground near them. I don't know your preference, but I have heard the dark shadow likes apples. Apple flavor is the best I have at the moment. Then he wrapped the capture tape around Tokoyami's arm and stood up to leave the room. Tokoyami Fumikage is captured. All Might announced, and Zuku smiled to himself. You know, if you work together you would have a good chance of victory. He said, then went back to the stairs before Tokoyami could reply. Going up the stairs, Zuku started searching around. He was on the third floor, the building has six floors. The most obvious floor to hide the bomb on would be the last floor, after all it would take the longest to reach. But at the same time it is too obvious. Kaminari was patrolling the second floor, and Tokoyami the third. Apparently Todoroki is guarding the bomb. Zuku decides that the third floor must not be the right one and continues to the fourth. He should have tried to ask, Dark Shadow would probably have let something slip. Oh, well, too late now. To his surprise, he easily finds the bomb on the fourth floor just two rooms away from the stairs. The location makes sense, considering that there is only one door to this room. Todoroki is just in front of the bomb, watching the entrance attentively. If Zuku tried to throw a dart now, he would probably hit it, but he wants to try to see something of Todoroki's fighting style as well. Smiling, Zuku decides to throw away the stealth, he activates the eyes of the mask again, effectively revealing his position, and walks to the door. The moment he steps inside the room, he feels a cold draft, and within seconds the whole room is frozen, and Zuku's feet are stuck to the floor. Powerful. Zuku comments smiling. But wasn't freezing the whole room a bit much. Better not to give you any chance to escape. Todoroki said in his inexpressive voice. And what will you do now? You haven't captured me yet. Zuku provoked. And you can't move. Todoroki replied. There's not much you can do now. Oh? He is underestimating Zuku. That is a mistake you only make once. Zuku slips his hand through the cloak, he knows that the only really visible part of him are his eyes, with the black cloak, nothing else is visible in this darkness. Careful not to make any noise, Izuku picked up his javelin and threw it, hitting Todoroki right in the neck. Never underestimate an enemy, Zuku said. Your enemies will not always play fair. In 5 seconds Todoroki was on the floor, asleep. 
Now, to free himself, Zuku had a few tricks he could use. He could simply take a his boot and walk to bomb in his socks. He could use the flaming whip again. Or he could use the hook. Aiming his grappling hook up, Zuku shot it to the ceiling, then pulled himself, breaking the ice from his foot and freeing himself. Then, dropping back to the floor, Zuku walked to the bomb and touched it. The bomb has been captured. The heroes won. All Might announced. The job, Zuku. His dad called in the communicator. Tokoyami is leaving and helping Kaminari. I'll carry Todoroki then. He'll be out for a few more minutes. The sleep drug should last around 10 minutes. Anything worrying? Only Kaminari, but he will be sent straight to Chiyo. Dad replied. We're going to have a lot to work on with this class, Dad. Zuku replied. Can I leave now? I want to start the analysis now to have everything ready by tomorrow. No all-nighters. His dad scolded. Pot. Meat. Kettle. Zuku replied. Your brat. Your brat. My brat. Dad confirmed. Go on, I'll handle the rest of the class. Thanks, Dad. Zuku replied. I promise to try to sleep. I'll hold you on that promise. Dad replied, then logged out of the communication. Smiling to himself, Zuku made way to his office yes, he has an office to start working on his analyses. The first thing he did was to divide the students into three groups, based on their control over their quirks. Excellent, acceptable, and work on it ASAP. To no one's surprise, most students fit in, acceptable. Izuka put Iorozu, Ijiro, and Kuda into the excellent group, based on what they showed today, but if necessary, they can be moved. The work on an ASAP group was reserved to the ones that are actively hurting themselves with their quirks and could suffer long-term damage if not corrected. Thankfully, only two students are in this group this year. Kaminari and Aoyama. Aoyama suffers stomach aches if he uses his laser for more than one second, so Izuka needs to make sure his quirk isn't messing with his organs before creating a strategy to work with him. Depending on what they discover, Izuka might move him into the acceptable group and ask Uncle Mick to help him with his training. Present Mick has much more experience at teaching students to learn control. And Kaminari, this is an urgent case. If Kaminari continues to short-circuit his own brain, he may suffer irreversible damage. This is a case that Izuku has already decided to take into his own hands. Besides Kaminari, the students that Izuku really wants to talk to are Todoroki, Tokoyami, and Shinsu. All three demonstrate the same problem but in different ways. They are afraid of their own quirk. Todoroki, so far has not used his flames at any point, another red flag since he is the son of Endeavor. Whether this is fear or rebellion, Izuku has no idea, but certainly Todoroki does not have adequate control of his flames. Tokoyami seems to be afraid of losing control, and therefore afraid of the dark. He and Dark Shadow seem to act like brothers, but at the same time, Tokoyami shows fear. Maybe some kind of trauma. Something to be questioned later. Shinsu has serious self-esteem issues, as well as having no idea about the limits of his brainwashing who was the idiot who chose that name. Izuku will talk to Netsu later to see if it's possible to change later. He probably never had a chance to train. Shinsu and Todoroki show signs of abuse. Unfortunately, until I finish building the case against Endeavor, not much can be done to help Todoroki, except to keep him as long as possible away from the flaming garbage can. Now, for Shinsu, Izuku can do something. They only hope that the boy will accept their help. They know that Shinsu is in the system, and as someone who chose to live on the streets rather than end up in foster care, Izuku knows how Shinsu must be treated. Facing the shelf with 19 notebooks that Izuku organized this morning before class, they pick up the first notebook, with a Pikachu on the cover, and begin to write. They have a lot of work to do and they promised they would try to sleep tonight. Shouta's son is a brat. Why did Shouta ever let him and Netsu meet? Oh, right, it was that, or Izuku ending up in Tartarus. Unfortunately, having most of his education taken care of by Netsu, Izuku learned many things from the rat Satan. Exploiting loopholes was one of them. Izuku promised he would sleep, and he did. He slept at 5.30 am when he wakes up every day at 6 am. But he did sleep. Which means that class 1 will have to deal with the sleep-deprived Izuku. And the sleep-deprived Izuku is a brutally sincere and unfiltered Izuku. Shouta just hopes that no one leaves traumatized. But just in case, before homeroom, he talks to Inui and warns him that some students may end up having to visit him earlier than planned. But well, there are other things to take care of that morning. Like the infestation of vultures sorry, the press that are at the gates harassing the students trying to get some statement from someone regarding All Might as a teacher. How does the giant buffoon manage to cause trouble even when he is not around? This means that Shouta has to stand at the entrance helping the students to get in safely. Perfect. How could his day start in a better way? To make matters worse, upon entering the teacher's lounge, Power Loader was trying to fix the coffee maker because apparently, Shouta's number one headache source broke it earlier. Apparently, the machine burned his hand, so the idiot punched it. Well, no coffee for Shouta. It's not like he wasn't already in a bad mood. As he enters the room at least everyone is silent, great he makes an announcement. Today, you'll have to do a special activity. 
Shadow pauses dramatically and secretly relishes on the kids' panicked faces. You'll elect a class representative. Such a normal activity. Most cheer, but Shadow quickly silences them with his usual Shadow glare. Any questions? All 19 students raised their hands. You can't elect Izuku. Everyone lowered their hands. Volunteers. Why did he ask that? Immediately the class erupts in chaos, with almost everyone volunteering for the position. Shadow sighs and starts entering his sleeping bag. I'll take a nap. Don't wake me up unless someone is dying. From there, the Shadow tunes down their discussion, only replying when Iida asks if voting is an acceptable method to elect. I don't care what method you chose as long as you decide before the end of homework. Fortunately, this class is minimally logical. They end up electing Yeoi Rosu as president and Iida as vice president. Good choices. After that, at the end of homeroom, Shada takes the list that Izuku gave him earlier and announces. Attention, Halspin. One by one during today's class you will be called into Izuku's office, yes he has an office, to discuss your quirk, fighting style, clothing. Izuku is a licensed and approved analyst by both HSPC and Netsu, so I recommend you make good use of this chance. Then he called the first one. Yeoi Rosu, you first. The rest will continue with your normal classes, someone takes notes to pass or later. Then he points the direction for Izuku's office and makes his way to his next class. Whatever Izuku does, now it's with him. Aoi Rosumono. Five minutes after the first signal, Izuku hears the first person knocking on their door, so he puts a friendly smile on their face and calls him. Come in. Then the door opens, and Aoi Rosu enters. Aoi Rosu said, Congratulations for being elected. Izuku said, pointing to the chair in front of his desk. Thank you, as always, Sensei. She replied shyly. Izuku, Zuku, Kuzu, Poltergeist, Ifrit, Duality. Pick one, but please don't call us Izawa. It will only be confusing when my father and I are together. Kuzu insisted. I know it can be a bit confusing, but in time everyone learns to distinguish between us. Zuku offered, getting up. Jasmine tea. Thank you. Gyoi Rosu replied, nodding. Then you can call me Momo. It's only fair. As you wish, Momo-san. Kuzu said. Five minutes later, each one had a teacup in their hands, and Zuku went straight to the point. Alright, I'll be blunt with my question, Momo. Are you really comfortable with your costume? Kuzu asked, sipping his tea. Well, not really. But there wasn't much choice. Momo explained. I need to have my skin exposed to use my quirk. But even so, my costume is showing more than I expected. Are you familiar with DNA suits? Zuku asked. It was my first plan. She admitted. But there was a note in my case saying that it was impossible to make something like that for a first year. Bullshit. Kuzu growled. Language, Kuzu. Zuku scolded. English if you may. Kuzu replied. Anyway, there's no such thing. I'll bring this to power later, later and we'll remake your costume. Zuku explained. Your costume at the moment is unacceptable. It doesn't offer any protection, not even midnight is that exposed. I get the impression that this is less a case of impracticality and more a situation of perverted students. Gross. We don't need another Mineta, we just got rid of one. Kuzu continued. I see. Momo replied, between shock and confusion. Now, I want your opinion on this. Zuku said, telepathically pulling out one of the notebooks on the shelf. This one had a periodic table on the cover. Your control over your quirk is already awesome, so there is not much to discuss for the moment. I have drawn some designs for your new costume, but your opinion is essential. The rest of the session was spent with Izuku and Momo, discussing the redesign of her costume, and possible support gear for her. At the end of the session, Izuku asked her to call Yuraka when she returned to class. Yuraka Chako. Alright. Who was the idiot who thought it was a good idea to put heels on a combat costume? Kuzu asked, looking up from the notebook with an astronaut on the cover. I never asked for heels. And the costume is much tighter than I thought it would be. Yuraka explained. One more thing to ask Powerloader later. Zuku sighed. I feel that we will end up with an entire support class expelled. Well, let's talk about your quirk for a bit. Kuzu said. You should start carrying nausea medicine in your belt. Zuku suggested. Should you need any more specific medication, I'm sure a recovery girl can arrange it. Just talk to her. I also suggest you do some tests to make sure your quirk doesn't cause you any permanent damage. Other than that, you should slowly start raising your limit. And of course do some hand-to-hand -hand training since you need to get closer to be effective. Kuzu continued. And put extra protection on your hands. A 5-point contact quirk means that if someone breaks or cuts your fingers, you are in trouble. Akigu Kasuki. Hey Lord Explosion Murder. Kuzu greeted when Kasuki entered. Don't start, Kuzu. Zuku scolded then turned to Kasuki. Well, Akigu, just to make things clear. What we say here are simply suggestions. You can ignore us if you want, but being a certified analyst with Netsu's approval, we like to think we know what we're talking about. Akigu simply nodded, avoiding Izuku's eyes. At least he's not yelling. Izuku waited a few awkward seconds. Well, eyes are. They said at the same time. 
you first, Zuku conceded. Can we talk? Kasuki asked. About everything. What, Bakugur? This meeting is to talk about your hero costume and your quirk. Kuzu explained. If you really want to talk, wait for us in front of the classroom after dismissal. Alright. Kasuki nodded, then gestured for the notebook. What do you have there? I'm happy you asked. Zuku grinned and pulled the notebook with the nuclear explosion on the cover. Now, how do you feel about putting shock absorbing braces under your gauntlets? The Ida tenure. Look, Ida Khan. It's nice that you admire your brother that much. Zuku said slowly, trying to pass his point as clearly as possible. But all that armor. How does it help you you're not ingenium, Ida, you are your own hero. The Jiro Masha. What kind of martial art did you say you practiced, again? Kuzu asked. You're pretty good at it, but maybe it's time to try varying a little. You already have some bad habits that I assume come from always fighting against the same person. Hagakurture. Boots and gloves. Her entire costume are only boots and gloves. Kuzu yelled while Zuku tried to muffle him. Oh, no, someone will get expelled. How dare they do something like that to a teenage girl. Sorry, Hagakur said. We should have checked this before. Zuku bowed to her. But this will be fixed, don't worry. Satoru Kido. Well, I would suggest carrying some energy gummies with you. Can't have you falling asleep because of your quirk in dangerous moments. Zuku said. You should also try thinking a bit more before rushing. Brute force will not always be enough. Shido Mina. Have you tried having a little chat with Yaoi Rosu? Zuku suggested. She can help you better understand the chemistry behind your acid, and from there, you can further increase your potency and or versatility. Acid Tsai. Acid. Call me, Tsu. Kira. Okay Tsu. Kuzu tried again. I'm dying to know how the hell you found out you could spit out your own stomach, but we can discuss that later. For now, tell me a little more about yourself. To what extent does your quirk affect your natural instincts? Zuku continued. Siro Hanta. Your mobility is nothing to laugh at. And you have a huge potential for quirk captures. Zuku started. But I have noticed a bad habit of underestimating your opponents. This kind of thing usually takes care of itself after the third time you have your ass handed to you by someone who seems weak. Kuzu interjected. But how about not letting it come to that? Hiro Kayaka. You urgently need noise cancelers. Kuzu said. And just like present Mick, your quirk will benefit immensely from proper support gear. I will schedule a conversation with Power Loader and pass the notes I have to him. He will certainly know what to do. Zuku continued. Aoyama Yuga. First of all, take this note and go to Recovery Girl. Zuku said as soon as the French boy entered. Until I am sure how your organs respond to your quirk, I can't give you any useful advice. So we will do some tests, and then we can discuss the results. Hiroshima Iger. Bare chest. Really? Kuzu deadpan. I'm not sure about what your idea of manly is. But there's a line between manly and dumb. Zuku continued. I know they say that men live less, but still, you don't need to try to prove these statistics. So how about we sit down and discuss how to keep you protected and at the same time maintain all your manliness. Kuzu cheered. Shaji Mizu. You, my good sir, have one of the most versatile quirks I have ever seen. Kuzu said. And you are very quiet, have you ever thought of practicing stealth? Zuku suggested. As a scout you would be unstoppable. Not to mention that your strength leaves many heroes in the dust. Kuda Koji. Don't worry, I can sign. Zuku said softly. Let me ask you. Can you communicate with any type of animal? Any real animal? Kuda signed. Doesn't work on people with mutations for example. Interesting, and versatile. Kuzu praised. What about insects? Are they considered animals? The last four are probably the most problematic. But Izuku came prepared. Tokoyami Fumikich. Hi, Tokoyami-san. Zuku greeted as soon as he saw the crow's head on his door. Good morning, Zuku-sensei, Kuzu-sensei. Oh, interesting. Tokoyami is the first one to greet both. Take a seat. We have much to talk about. Kuzu pointed at the chair, and Tokoyami quickly sat down. Then Zuku picked up an apple and gave it to Tokoyami. Can you call Dark Shadow? I want to talk to both of you. Tokoyami nodded, then the familiar shadow crow emerged from his stomach and curled above his shoulder. Tokoyami gave the apple to the shadow, which immediately started pecking at it. Let's start with the easy part. Zuku pulled the notebook with the crow on the cover. Your costume is great. Well planned, and offer protection in the key parts. I imagine that the cloak serves to cast a shadow to help Dark Shadow, am I correct? Your assumptions are correct. Tokoyami confirmed. This is Fumi, always worrying about Lil Old Me. Dark Shadow nuzzled Tokoyami's face, pulled it away but didn't deny. Well, I have a question for Dark Shadow. Kuzu said. Yesterday, during the training, you ignored Tokoyami's commands and charged at us. Why? Who would have thought that a crow-shaped shadow would have the ability to look ashamed? It was dark. Dark Shadow said shyly. Kuzu raised an eyebrow, and Tokoyami started explaining. Dark Shadow is greatly affected by brightness. He 
He's docile when it's bright, too much light, and he becomes timid. The raven boy explained. But when it's dark, the opposite happens. He becomes vicious and unruly. Hmm? Zuku scribbled a few lines in the notebook. And do you have any idea of why he acts like that? Do you share feelings? No, we don't. Dark Shadow said. I'm a quirk, but I have my own mind and feelings. We could test this with Shinsu Khan's help later. Zuku started muttering. I wonder if he could brainwash Tokoyami through Dark Shadow responses, or the opposite. Would one of them be able to snap the other? Would have he was interrupted by a karate chop on the head. Ouch. Kuzu. You are muttering again. Kuzu shrugged. Mimi. Zuku pouted, then looked back at Tokoyami. How bad can it get? If it's too dark, I might lose myself completely. Dark Shadow admitted. It happened only once. Tokoyami explained. Dark Shadow went completely berserk and started attacking anything that moved. We ended up hurting our father. After that he didn't finish, but it wasn't necessary. Izuku saw his files. Tokoyami is in foster care, and the implications are clear. Fortunately, Tokoyami shows no signs of abuse or neglect, but Izuku knows how cruel the system can be to children who have weak, mutations, or so-called villainous. Quirks, and Dark Shadow fits in two of these cases. Even without signs, Izuku will at least check to see if he is really safe. That is why Fumi sleeps with a nightlight. Dark Shadow continued. How old were you? Zuku gently asked. Eight. Tokoyami replied. Clarifying. Thank you for telling us. Kuzu nodded and threw another apple at Dark Shadow, and the crow immediately perked up and snatched the apple in the air. Whatever they told you, Tokoyami. What happened was not your fault. Zuku continued. You were only a kid, and still is. As for the problem at hand. Kuzu continued. We'll help you with it. Help us? Dark Shadow asked. How? It depends on what you are willing to try. Zuku explained. The first thing you need is to overcome the fear of your quirk. I don't fear Dark Shadow. Not in the traditional way. Zuku continued. But yes, you are afraid. If you didn't you wouldn't have problems with the dark. We'll help you control Dark Shadow, even when there is absolutely no light. Kuzu continued. And also help Dark Shadow to control himself. But for this we will need extra time. Would you be willing to meet us at the Field Omega on Tuesdays after class? Zuku asked. Tokoyami pondered for a few seconds, absent-mindedly petting Dark Shadow. Then after a few seconds, he nodded. Very well. There's no harm in trying. He said, and Dark Shadow nodded along with him. Izuku smiled brightly at them. Remember, Tokoyami, none of this is mandatory. If you feel that it's not working for you, you can tell me and we'll stop, no hard feelings. Zuku explained, and Tokoyami nodded again. You can go back for now. Would you mind calling Todoroki next? As you wish. Then Tokoyami got up and left the room. Todoroki Shadow. The heterochromatic boy entered the room about 5 minutes later. Face inexpressive as always, he nodded at Izuku, who gestured for the chair in front of him, and Todoroki sat down. Izuku pulled out the notebook with two men in navy suits on the cover facing each other. One in a red suit with lava on the background and the other in a white suit with blue sleeves with snow on the background. How are the classes going, Todoroki-kun? Kuzu asked first. Just fine, sensei. Todoroki replied. What do you want to discuss? Now, this will have to be handled delicately, so they decided to start with the lesser of the many problems that seem to have the same origin. For starters, you costume. Zuku said. Denied. Frankly, I don't know who approved it, but he should be fired. What do you mean? Todoroki asked in visible confusion. Does he really see nothing wrong? Todoroki, the biggest drawback of your quirk is frostbite. And you see nothing wrong with going into the field with half your body frozen. Kuzu deadpanned. Are you serious? You are resistant to temperature variation, not immune. Zuku continued. Frankly, this problem would be easily solved if you use your fire to balance your temperature. No? Todoroki slammed his hands on the table. I'll never use it. Then he started getting up. This is a waste of time. Sit down, Todoroki. Kuzu commanded. If you want to ignore what I have to say, that is your choice, but at least you will listen to me. Todoroki hesitantly sat back down, his eyes focusing on anything other than Izuku's. As long as he's listening, Izuku will not chide him for it. Tell me Todoroki, are you being serious about this? Being a hero? Zuku asked. Of course I am. Todoroki replied. Are you, though? Let's get down to the facts. Kuzu said harshly. You refuse to use your fire. Which means that no matter what you try, you are only using half of your potential. How is this being serious? I wouldn't use his quirk. Todoroki repeated. This is practically a mantra by now. I don't need his quirk. Do you really believe that? Kuzu continued. You don't know anything. Todoroki said. You don't know what Endeavor did. Believe me, Todoroki. I know a thing or two about bastard parents with fire quirks. Kuzu replied. You Todoroki stopped and blinked at him. What? Do you know about the eye burner? Zuku asked. Serial killer. He terrorized Misatafu for more than 10 years. Kill people with green eyes. 
What does this have to do with anything? Todoroki was confused, but Izuku had his full attention. His cork was fire breathing. Kuzu explained, then arched his head upwards and blew a small flame. Pretty self explanatory. Wait, are you? Midoriya Hasashi. That was his name. Zuku said. Midoriya Zuku. That was our name before Shouta adopted us. Then he looked Todoroki in the eyes and asked. So, do you really think we don't understand you? Todoroki hesitated for a few seconds, going through what Izuku just told him. He wants me to surpass All Might. He finally said. He did everything for the school. He bought my mother and forced her into a court marriage. My three older siblings, he considered all of them failures. My oldest brother died because of him. I refuse to be his tool. I just showed you my quirk, Todoroki. The quirk I inherited from a villain who is locked up in Tartarus. Do you think this quirk is his? Kuzu said. It is not. My sperm donor could only breathe fire. I can breathe and create fire from any other part of my body. My flames can reach temperatures he never dreamed of reaching. He jabbed a finger in his chest. This quirk is not his. It is mine. Then he pointed at Todoroki. That quirk is not his. It's yours. And fuck whatever Endeavor tries to say. He won't last long. I Todoroki looked down at his hands again. I don't know if I'm ready yet. And you don't have to be. Zuku said gently. I will not force you to do anything. But we will work until you can use your flames comfortably. And if you want to surpass All Might, it will be of your own free will, not his. On Wednesdays, starting next week, meet us at Field Omega. Kuzu continued. And every time you find yourself thinking that your quirk belongs to Endeavor, I want you to repeat these words, this quirk is mine, and Endeavor can take his opinion and shove it straight up his ass. Todoroki actually chuckled when he heard this. Alright. Todoroki nodded, then he took a deep breath and continued. This quirk is mine, and Endeavor can take his opinion and shove it straight up his ass. His lips curved into the smallest of his smiles. This is kind of nice to say. Therapeutic. I know right. Kuzu grinned. Please stop corrupting him, Kuzu. Zuku chitted. And Todoroki, hang on just a little longer. Endeavor can do whatever he wants, he will face the consequences of his actions. Okay? Todoroki nodded. Can I go now? Just a second. Zuku said, then scribbled something on his notebook, tore the page, and gave it to Todoroki. If you want to treat these bruises that you are hiding, give this note to Recovery Girl, and she will know what it is about. No questions asked. Todoroki nodded and got up to leave. He stopped at the door and gave a last glance at Izuku. Thank you sensei. You don't have to thank me, Todoroki. Zuku waved at him. Any teacher here would have done the same. But no one ever did it before. So thank you. Todoroki nodded again. You're welcome. Kuzu replied. Now, get going, there's two more problem children to deal with, and we'd like to end this before lunch. Right? Lunch Rush said he would make Katsudan today, and we'd hate to lose. Zuku said, almost drooling. I'll be going then. Todoroki said. Can you call Kaminari next? Sure. Then he left. Kaminari Denki. When Kaminari entered the office, there was an aquarium filled with water, a faucet on Kuzu's table, and no fish. Izuku gestured for him to sit down. Kaminari sat down and looked into Izuku's eyes for a few seconds. Oh, he's trying to figure out which one he's talking to. Hey, ere he tried greeting. Zuku. Both. Kuzu said, giggling. Look, a blue and yellow eye. He leaned closer so Kaminari could see better. Before starting to argue, Kaminari picked up his phone and asked. Hey, could you give me your number? Zuku raised an eyebrow but wrote it on a paper for him. Here, why? He asked. Ida wants to make a group chat for the class. But no one has your number. Kaminari explained while putting the number on his phone. And yeah, I know you are technically our teacher, but you're also the same age as us, so we wanted to include you. Ayan Zuku got a message on his phone, and there was a video archive attached to a new number when he looked. Kuzu owes me a batch of cookies. Zuku checked the recording briefly. It was the recording of what dad said yesterday to All Might during class. Oh, they'll have to play this tonight. This will be better than a film night. Perfect. Kuzu grinned at Kaminari. I'll bring you cookies tomorrow. Right? What is this? Kaminari pointed to the aquarium. It's for a demonstration. We'll get to it. Zuku said, then opened the Pikachu notebook. So, Kaminari-kun. Let's start with your costume. Sure. Kaminari said, slightly nervous. I like your costume. It's simple, stylish and functional. Kuzu explained. My only recommendation is that you order some kind of plating to wear under the costume. You can never have too much extra protection. It's a nice idea. Kaminari smiled. Now, the elephant in the room. Kuzu started, and Kaminari's smile fell. You quirk a short circuit in your brain. Yeah. It happens when I go over my limit. Kaminari said, scratching the back of his head. I end up like you saw for about an hour. But that is all. It's not so bad. It is that bad, Kaminari. Zuku replied. Brain damage is no joke, it can cause you permanent damage if not treated. And that is what we are here to solve. Kuzu continued. 
Zuku stood up and put a disposable cup under the faucet. Let's suppose that this is you. The water would be the electricity inside your body. Zuku explained. By the way, are you a battery or a generator? I'm a what now? Kaminari asked in visible confusion. Do you generate electricity or just store it? Kuzu explained. Depending on the answer, the route to take will be different. Oh, I see. Kaminari smiled again. I generated. Great, back to the example. Zuku pointed to the aquarium again. Having your quirk under control, you can decide how much power you want to use, similar to this stat. He opened the faucet slowly, and the cup started to fill. But the way you're using it Zuku raised his arm towards the tap. It's like doing this. He pulled his arm, ripping the tap from the aquarium, and Kaminari rushed to get out of the water's way. There is no control, and in the end, you are depleted and can't do anything else, even if we disregard the airhead mode. Then he raised his arm again, collecting all of the spilled water and pulling it back into the aquarium, then putting back the tap. Any question? Kuzu asked. I've been trying to control my quirk for a long time, but I don't know what to do. Kaminari said. There are quirks like mine in my family, but none that powerful. The more powerful, the harder to control. Zuku nodded. Our first course of action is to find a way to keep all this electricity away from that pretty head of yours. He flickered Kaminari's forehead. I have some exercises in mind. Are you free on Thursdays? I guess. Kaminari replied. Great, next Thursday. Meet us at Field Omega after class. Kuzu said. And call Shinsu for us please. He's the last one. Alright, it's a date then. Kaminari said, getting up. If you pay for dinner, of course. Kuzu winked, and Kaminari blushed, rushing out of the office. Kuzu laughed, seeing Kaminari running, if he's not ready to be flirted back, he shouldn't try. Shinsu Hitashi. As soon as Zuku saw the mop of purple hair on his door, he instantly gestured for the chair. Hello Shinsu-kun. He greeted, pulling the notebook with the purple cat on the cover. Hi sensei. Shinsu replied, but there was something strange with his voice. It seemed strained. Zuku looked up from the notebook and took on Shinsu's expression. The kid looked just as neutral as Shadow always is. But unlike Izuku's dad, Shinsu doesn't have years of experience as an underground hero to better his poker face. Zuku could see the slightly pained expression on his face, and leaned a bit closer to have a better view. Sensei. Shinsu said in surprise, leaning back, but Zuku put his hands on his cheeks to stop him. Don't move. Zuku said softly, but he could already feel Kuzu's anger spiking. And honestly, if Zuku could feel anger, he's sure he would be furious right now. How could he not be when he sees the marks on Shinsu's face? Barely concealed by a poor attempt at makeup, above his nose, on his cheeks, and chin. These scars are more than familiar to Izuku. They saw it many times when Uncle Mick was not wearing his makeup. There's only one thing that can cause it. Muslim. Zuku said in shock, and Shinsu's eyes widened instantly. The kid pulled back from Izuku and covered his face with his hands. Shinsu Khan. Kuzu said in silent rage. Not directed at the kid. No, he could never get angry at a kid for being hurt. The fury was directed at whoever hurt him. Who did this to you? Well that is it for now make sure to like and subscribe see you guys later.